I'm Tisha Bader, and in the news, the resumption of Aliyah immigration flights from Ethiopia to Israel, bringing Ethiopian Jews home to the Jewish state. The flights are part of Operation Sur Israel, spearheaded by Aliyah and Integration Minister Panina Tamano Shata, herself an Ethiopian Jewish immigrant. Sur Israel is aimed to bring some 3,000 Ethiopians who have been waiting for years at holding camps in Addis Ababa and Gondar to come to Israel. The operation was paused in March of last year and picked up once again at the beginning of June with two flights, one on June the 1st and then on June the 2nd. Jeffrey Schoenfeld is chairman of Jewish Federations of North America's Israel and Overseas Committee, and he was among those on board the flight on June the 1st, joining Knesset member Tamano Shata as well as other community leaders from the Jewish federations across North America and officials from organizations like the Jewish Agency, who also spend time in Ethiopia. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us here on JBS. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So before we get into what your flight was like, what your time in Ethiopia was like, can you help give us some background on this operation and what its goals are? So I, I will rewind the videotape to 11 years ago when I first went to Ethiopia on what was the last flight. Uh, there was an agreement at that point among a number of constituencies, uh, the Israeli government, the Ethiopian government, various organizations involved in Ethiopian Aliyah that determined that the last of the Ethiopian Jews were brought to Israel. Not so fast. Uh, over time, it's become clear that there were many others who were eligible to come to Israel, not necessarily under the law of return, which typically guides Aliyah, but under a number of other circumstances, particularly that there are many Jews in Ethiopia who have living relatives in Israel already. And so there has been an enormous effort undertaken over the past decade to get those remaining Jews who have the right to come to Israel to be reunited with their families. And that has been caught up in a lot of political back and forth over the past decade. But uh, in the last year, the Israeli government under the auspices of the Minister of Interior agreed that there were 3000 Jews that could come now to Israel. I will say from experience, the 3,000 number is a bit arbitrary. It's probably going to be a larger number, not multiples of that, but it may, by some estimates, be 4,500 or 5,000 Jews who, under the existing criteria, will be eligible to come to Israel. The involvement of Jew Jewish federations of North America today is the same involvement that has existed for 80 years which is a, this unwritten agreement, it's, you're not gonna see it written anywhere, that global philanthropy, very much driven by North American dollars, but not exclusively, global philanthropy has the responsibility for funding Aliyah, for getting those citizens in the world, Jewish citizens who wanna get to Israel, getting them to Israel. In many cases over the last 80 years, it was to get them out of harm's way. But today we also live in a world of what people call Ali of choice, where people are not directly in harm's way, but they choose to make Ali and live in Israel. Global philanthropy makes that happen. Once new citizens of Israel reach Israel, it then becomes largely the responsibility of the government to fund their absorption into Israeli society, which can be very quick. If you're talking about a college educated career, French national, former French national, or it can be many years if you are an Ethiopian young adult, you don't speak Hebrew, you don't necessarily have the skills to integrate into Israeli society, but uh, the integration process can take several years as a result. But global philanthropy of which JFNA plays a major role has had that responsibility. We take it, we take that commitment 
seriously day in and day out. And it directly obviously has a role in facilitating Ethiopian Aliyah. So you spoke about the fact that you were in Ethiopia before quite a while ago. What was the experience like this time? You were there for several days. And specifically, I, I would love to hear more about these holding camps because I refer to them all the time in my newscast, but what that actually means, some of these people have been living there for years and years and years. And I wonder what their if, what their if, outlook is like, what their experience is like in these camps. This may sound like a dramatic statement, but Ethiopians in many ways are the original Zionists, meaning they, there have been Ethiopian Jews probably for thousands of years, and they have had one dream passed on from generation to generation, which is to get to Israel. Before there was a state of Israel, before Theodor Herzl was even born, that has been the dream. And the minute that they've had the opportunity to do so, which includes putting themselves in harm's way, crossing the desert, before there was anything called Ethiopian Aliyah, many Ethiopian Jews crossed the desert to Sudan because they understood without knowing, no communication, but they understood there was a way to get to Israel if they could get to Sudan. Thousands of Ethiopians died on that journey. And Israel celebrates or remembers those Ethiopian Jews that died on the journey uh, on the same day that they celebrate Jerusalem Day which just happened last week. Uh, and so the minute that Aliyah becomes possible, it becomes their, their, their mission. Most of the Jews historically in Ethiopia have lived in one community. There are others, but most have lived in a community called Gondar, an agricultural community. They've given up their agricultural way of life to live in the village itself, waiting for Aliyah, which means they live on barely anything. And they rely on philanthropy for nourishment, for health care, just to get from today to tomorrow. The living conditions, all of us who live in Western societies would describe as very, very poor. I visited a woman who was a grandmother. Six people lived in one room. The room was maybe 10 by 10. Everything except the bathroom happens in that room. Six people sleep in a twin size bed. They, 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 they layer themselves across the bed on what we would call the short side of the bed. I don't think they think they live a poor life. They live a life of family. They live a life deeply rooted in Jewish, in, in what we would call Judaism, Jewish ritual, Jewish practice, uh, but they've been waiting to go to Israel. She's been waiting 25 years. I saw her one day in Gondar. The next day I saw her on an airplane flying <laughs> to Israel. Um, it is her life stream. The reason she's able to do it with her grandchildren and remaining children is because she has a son in Israel already. That gave me chills. I mean, it, it really is such an emotional thing. And, and we see pictures of this community, as you mentioned, marking the Jewish year as, as we do in the Jewish world. And yet they must feel so isolated and alone and they have held well, they, on to Judaism and to hope for, as you mentioned, this grandmother, 25 years. That is an incredible amount of time to somehow maintain this way of life in, in such difficult, difficult situations and not knowing when, guess, if ever, this, this move to Israel will happen. One question I've gotten is, are they bitter because they've had to wait so long? And the answer is absolutely not. They live a joyful life. They live a joyful life as Jews. On the morning, one of the mornings I was in Gondar was uh, the first day of the new month and Rosh Chodesh services were held. A thousand people were at services. 
a thousand people in sort of an open air pavilion, which is where they gather. Um, it wouldn't look anything like what we would call a synagogue. This is very primitive. Men and women were separated. The entire service was in Hebrew. Everybody chanted prayers that would sound very familiar to anyone else. All the men were wearing kippot. Some were wearing tallit. Uh, it was as normal a Jewish practice experience as I've experienced anywhere, except they were all black. These are the original Jews of color. Um, but they, every other ritual in life, from bris to death, to observing Shabbat, to celebrating Pesach, those are the milestones that they observe, just like we do in Western societies. And um, it, it was beautiful to see. There's actually a video that uh, JFNA shared. I'm, I'm not sure if it was the same day that you were in the synagogue in, in Gondar and singing Am Yisrael Chai, the yes. people of Israel live. It, it, we'll, show it, we'll show it now to our viewers. So emotional, and I can't imagine what it felt like to be there in that moment. And, and there's another a tweet that reads, you know, this is where your dollars are going. This is this is the moment, or these are the moments that propel federations and the Jewish agency and so many other organizations to do the work they do to see those moments, especially, of course, to be on that airplane. Um, with the 180 or so new Olim from Ethiopia, bringing them to Israel, singing on the airplane, celebrating in that way. I, I, that just must have been an incredible thing to experience. Sometimes the numbers can be overwhelming. And I'm drawn to this work as a volunteer leader and as well as a donor because I've had the privilege of seeing philanthropy change people's lives. And we change lives one one life at a time, uh, and I never I never forget that personally. And when we have an opportunity, if I go back to that grandmother, she is an individual, but she's the grandmother, the matriarch of a family, and this is changing her life. It's changing her family's life. It's setting a new path forward for generations who are yet born. And I couldn't be more proud that it is philanthropic dollars that's making that happen. And speaking of changing one, li one life, um, as I mentioned, uh, the Minister of Aliyah and Integration, Panina Tamano Shata, herself was brought on, on a mission like this one when she was a child. She is now the first Ethiopian born minister and member of Israel's Knesset. And she has been pushing for this resumption of these flights from day one. She is a fierce uh, force to be reckoned with. I, I think you will probably Indeed. agree with me. Um, what was the time like that you spent with her and what, are you, what did you well, see as far as- Thank you for asking that question because our relationship goes back 11 years. When I was on the last flight, out of Ethiopia, I was on that flight with Minister Tamano Shata. Wow. When she was just an MK, she was a new MK. She was not yet the Minister of Absorption. And we traveled together for several days. So I got to know her in her early years, um, where she was just as fierce an, an activist, an advocate for Ethiopia. Aliyah as she is today. She has a much broader set of experience today uh, or responsibilities, which obviously include Ukraine and Russian Aliyah, which are quite important 
particularly for the Jewish agency. So they have multiple uh, groups that they are bringing and bringing to Israel and assimilating into Israeli society at the same time. So this is a very pivotal moment for the Jewish agency, for Aliyah, the numbers will be very, very significant this year. Uh, but we, we, Global Philanthropy, will make sure the resources are there to make it all happen. And I know she has expressed frustration with how long this has taken. What, and you mentioned, you know, political, bureaucratic, red tape. Um, is that basically what's behind why it's taken so long to get these people who all they want to do is come to Israel and have been, you know, sacrificing and living this very, very difficult life and it's taking so long to get them? There is complication. It's not simple. The Jews in Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a Christian country. There were centuries where Jews converted to Christianity. And now that they have the opportunity to live a Jewish life, some want to live a Jewish life. So the law of return covers those who are living a Jewish life and have a Jewish parent, grandparent. That isn't always been the case for Ethiopians. So deciding who can come and who can't come, who's Jewish and who's not Jewish, I, uh, it, it is a political issue, but it's also a very complicated issue. So I have some sympathy for the complication, but I would also say there's a way to figure it out. There are local rabbis and those rabbis can tell you who's living a Jewish life and who just showed up in the last 15 minutes and said, oh, I'm Jewish too. We can figure this out. And we as a global community are trying to figure it out. But ultimately the decision of who could come and who needs to stay is a decision of the Ministry of Interior in Israel. It is not a decision by the Jewish agency. It's not a decision by philanthropy. It is exclusively the decision of one part of the Israeli government. I do want to mention a quote, uh, chair of the board of trustees of uh, the JFNA, Mark Wilf said, this sacred effort is the highest expression of the dedication of Jewish federations to help Jews wherever they live. And we will continue to work with our partners to support the first steps in Israel of Ethiopian Olim. And of course, as you noted earlier, that integration process is not simple. They have a long difficult road ahead of them, but at least they are in Israel now. Talk though about this mission that is at the base of Jewish federations of North America to help Jews wherever they are. It is a, a very broad, and you, you just mentioned Ukraine, which, which I know is, is a huge part of, of what your efforts are these days. Talk a bit about what that means on a day-to-day -day basis and what that means to you. It is a ancient and sacred uh, calling um, for Jew the, the, the Jewish people that we all have responsibility for each other. It literally goes back millennial, millennium. And we all take that responsibility very seriously today, whether we contribute $10 or $10,000 or much more. Uh, we, the Jewish community in North America in particular, have abided by that commitment. And there are times when we need to step up as we are doing today. We've raised to date, an extra year to date, an extra $64 million to support those fleeing Ukraine. That might mean just keeping them safe and secure across the border in Poland or Moldova or wherever they may be, or it may be getting them to Israel for those that choose to make Aliyah. But safety, security, eventually getting to Israel for those who want, that becomes our commitment today, yesterday, tomorrow, and for years to come. And I think Obviously, the, the financial aspect is, is important and allows you to do so much of the work you do. But that sentiment of Jews being responsible one for the other, I think, is 
has so many, um, has such great meaning. And that is really the, the statement of that and the understanding of that when we see Jews in Ethiopia, when we see Jews in Ukraine, to have that understanding that we will be there for each other, we are of the same people is just so important in and of itself. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And it's why I'm part of a very large community of volunteers and donors who make sure we live those words. And uh, I couldn't be more proud of the work that's being done this year in Ukraine, in Ethiopia, in Russia. Uh, it is not yet reaching the headlines, but economic conditions in Russia have turned very difficult very quickly. And so there is now a significant amount of Aliyah that's occurring from Russia in particular to Israel, uh, continuing a trend that began many, many years ago. But the numbers are more significant from Russia than they are from almost anywhere else in the world. Very interesting. What are you seeing as far as just getting back to the flights from Ethiopia? So there were two flights, June 1st and June 2nd, each with about 180 uh, new Olim, Ethiopian Jews coming to Israel. And the goal is 3,000. What is that? How does that break down over the next year? Is it over the next few years? There's going to be flights almost every few weeks. Um, it's important to understand that this is a bit of an embarrassment for the Ethiopian government. Nobody, no government loves to see people leaving their country. Nobody loves to see a mass exodus. They don't want publicity around it. So the agreement has been to spread it out over time. So it's under the radar screen a bit. There's no, gonna be no big announcement uh, that's gonna hit newspapers. And we're respectful of that. But the, the goal is there will be flights spread out across the year, but we hope to bring all 3000 within about a year. Wow. Will you be on, will you continue to get on flights, Jeff? Or I hope to, I hope, you to. hope to, but How I, is- but I'm also conscious that I want other people to have that ex- precious, precious privileged experience that I had of being in Ethiopia, seeing one day how people are living of a very, um, very low income existence, not unhappy, but li- having the dream of getting to Israel and being on a flight with them the next day as they realize their dreams. It's such a beautiful and powerful experience to have. Well, Jeffrey, thank you for the work that you and federations do and the Jewish agency and volunteers, as you mentioned, like yourself, who make this their, their life's work. Really, it's all a and privilege. thank you so much. Jeffrey Schoenfeld is chairman of Jewish Federation of North America's Israel and Overseas Committee. We thank him so much for his time. Thank you for having me. And thank you as always to our director, Sloan Copeland, managing director, Dara Golub, transmissions manager, John McDevitt, technical manager, Michael Paley, and our producer, Carol Lilienthal. And thank you for watching In the News. Be well. <laughs>